Welcome everyone to Ethereum Boulder. Uh, yeah, 2019 Eth Boulder. Uh, my name is Michael Green. I'm a co-organizer of this meetup, and I want to start up by thanking Galvanize for having us. Uh, for everyone who doesn't know, Galvanize is the learning community for technology, and they have courses in uh, data science, web development, um, they have a new part-time data analytics course, and they have office space, co-working, and awesome events like this. And they are kind enough to host us, and we're kind enough to uh, accommodate our schedule for this year, which wasn't easy for them, so we really appreciate that. And if you want to learn more about Galvanize, you can uh, talk to any of the people at the front desk or check out their website. And... Tonight, uh, Austin Griffith is going to be presenting on meta transactions, uh, subscriptions, burner wallets, and some other stuff. And so the format is the presentation, then we're going to go to the attic next door where we will be using one of Austin's products to buy beers. So that's super fun. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I guess we'll just bring up Austin Griffith, who's the director of research at Gitcoin, to tell us what he's working on. Okay, uh, so yeah, I'm Austin Griffith, Director of Research at Gitcoin. Uh, I've got a bunch of projects to talk about. I kind of did one slide per project. We'll spend more time on the important ones and less time on the less important ones. Uh, I would love questions along the way, so anytime just jump in and say hey and just, just talk out loud. That's all good. Uh, here we go. Okay, so uh, about a year and a half ago now, I realized Ethereum was rad. Um, uh, maybe we should, like, hands, should I explain what a hash function key pairs transactions? Maybe a minute, just sure. busting through the basics real quick. So a hash function is like a one direction thing, right? So you can put anything in one side, and it's going to spit out something of arbitrary link that's like deterministically computed, and it's one direction, so if I give you a hash of something, you're going to have a really hard time going back the other way, hash functions. So then a key pair is, uh, it's like you have a private and a public key pair, and the public key pair is derived from the private key pair, and the private key pair can be used to sign things that then someone given your public key could prove that you signed it. So that's key pairs. Uh, transactions are basically like to, from, amount, and then you sign it with your key pair, so then you can tell who, uh, who it came from and that, it's, that it works. A Merkle tree is basically using that hash function but to hash things kind of hierarchically. So like uh, if I have 100 files in a directory, I can hash all those files and then have one hash that represents the directory, and then let's say I have multiple directories, I can hash all of those and hash all of those. So basically those hashes all the way up at the top will change as little pieces change here and there. And to say that I have the hash for an entire directory basically proves that any of those things are there. And you can kind of have the opposite side of the tree and, and kind of like prove that a certain thing exists within the tree. And sort of that's where blockchain came from, where we have blocks and then it's like the hash of the block and the block is mined. And as you go deeper into the blocks, it basically gets more cryptographically secure. Uh, and then smart contracts are like little programs that were run deterministically on all nodes at the same time. They all produce the exact same thing. We can all agree on them. And uh, a miner basically does some proof of work to solidify that in the blockchain. Okay, so my first failure was concurrence. I tried to build a decentralized Oracle exploration and uh, I learned a crap load about Ethereum, like how to provision a, a geth node, how to write scripts to, to push stuff out, uh, how to deploy contracts, how contracts talk to each other, how contract inheritance works, uh, migrating contracts, things I failed at, game theory, uh, learning how to shill something. Basically, I posted it on like ETH dev and was like, yep, you know, ICO, ICO in a week, bro. No, it didn't work that way, and uh, it was a good lesson for how things work uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, one thing I also should have added there is governance. On-chain governance is super hard, and this was like sort of my first failure at on-chain governance. Uh, but what I got from that was this really cool library that I use for orchestration, so I can compile, deploy, test, and publish things from the command line really easily, and that's Clevis. So then the next thing I did was I was like, well, if I can't build, like there's always going to be someone better than me at nerding. But 
is there going to be someone better than me at nerding and arting and blockchaining at the same time? And that's where Galias came from. So I love making games. I used to make Facebook games. I lived on those for a long time. So Galias is like a resource management game where you had ERC, and this came out I think in February or maybe a little bit before that. Uh, you have tokens, ERC20 and ERC721s. You kind of sail around. Uh, there's a link here. I'll share the slides. You can get in and play. It's just Galias.io. And, you know, there's just like a little world where you sail around and uh, everybody in here is a different person and uh, you can buy land and then you can eventually like sail to other islands. Okay. Does the game ever end? The game does not ever end. It doesn't. So did you see how the ships were moving? So, okay, so let's talk. Uh, oh, so commit reveal randomness was something I used to catch fish. Like I, I put, I like over-engineered the heck out of it just so I could learn how things work. So when you catch a fish, you basically commit and that's your bait that's going into the water and then you reel in and that's your reveal. And if you have a certain randomness on chain that is enough to catch a fish, you catch the fish. The, the fish is a, a, an ERC 721, no, the fish is an ERC 20. And you can sell the fish to the market or the fishmonger and get copper and there's like a whole currency and everything in there. But uh, emergent things that kind of came out of this. One was IPFS deployment. So basically the code is static. The, the entire backend is just Ethereum. So there's no servers, there's no centralization. Basically you could play it from the repo. You can clone the repo down and just pull it up and play the game. So it's using Ethereum as the backend. Well what happens there is every time I do a static code push, of a major update, I'll also redeploy the contracts. And the contracts have lineage, so you can basically go and play any of them by just going to the IPFS endpoint. So when I deployed a game or I deployed a change on one of my Facebook games, I would get like death threats. Like, why did you change this mechanic? You're an awful person. Just really terrible things that I didn't enjoy. Well, now I can just be like, GFYS, go on IPFS, right? And so you can just like go play any version you want and as I iterate, basically it's a fork and people can choose what fork to follow. Uh, another kind of er emergent mechanic that came from block times is like the, the ship, so you don't wanna have to like move your ship every block, right? If you had to hit go left, go left, go left, that's not gonna work. But how, how can we come up with a way where it can work well with the way the blockchain works? And one way is just to basically you, you you trigger one transaction to put up your sales, and then your ship just sails along. As each block is mined, it moves its speed pixel-wise. So I called that like sailing on the blockchain, and it was something that just kind of emerged from what you need to do. But basically, you put your sails up, and your ship will just kind of float along until you're ready, and then you send another transaction to throw your anchor out, and then you go fishing. And there's like war and stuff that's coming up soon, but like Galias is kind of my love project, but it's back burnered for, for trying to push the space forward a little bit more. This is more of like performance art, is Are what I would explain playing? this. What's that? Yeah, for sure, there, there's a ton of, so in the last fork, so the most recent fork, not as much, so I presented this at the NFT Summit at, I think it was called the NFT Summit. Yeah, there was an NFT Summit in San Francisco, I presented this and we like all played, like the room like went fishing with me and we had a little fishing contest. Oh, by the way, there's also some stickers of the fish, if you'd like to have one of those. Uh, we all fished and there was a lot of people, but every account that goes in there and puts up their sales, basically they can walk away and that thing is sailing on the blockchain forever, right? They, they fired an event that said this ship at this point started sailing and the world is round. So basically when the ship gets the other side, he just comes back to the other side. And so what happens is once a lot of people have done that and this happened, there's like hundreds of ships and they're just like all messy. So it's kind of fun to deploy a new contract because you get like a clean slate and it also regenerates the land. The land is all generated based on the hash of the land contract. So you get like a whole new terrain every time you deploy to. Ooh, that was too long on that slide. Let's, let's go faster through some of these. Okay, so uh, Galias was fun. Um, and then ETH Denver came along and I was like, I gotta do something awesome with these new ERC 721s that came out. So uh, perfect collectibles, like that's, it's like what an ERC721 is to me is a POG. It's like this collectible that's non-fungible in terms of uh, like no one else has this exact one, right? And uh, so there's some stickers here. I'm, I'm taking them out of the plastic for the first time. There's like the little smiley face guy and the little eight ball if you want one, they're up here. Uh, so the cool thing about this is we didn't have to build a market in or anything like this. This sort of started teaching me about extensibility of blockchain. I could make something that fit the standard and then someone else would build a market. OpenSea would build a market. Someone else would build something for trading. Basically, I, I build the storage element of 
who owns what, and then I build a secondary contract with like the game mechanics, and you kind of like move, you say, okay, so now the game is actually in control of these 10 pogs, and we're gonna use commit reveal to decide who wins, right? And it's basically just like what pogs was, if you're old enough to remember, you're throwing a slammer down, you're trying to flip them over. Uh, we got community art, look how rad that is, look at that. Look, <laughs> the Lenny and Carl Ying Yang, that is the best. So, and also, let's see if I can pull this up. So I went back and I found my very first email to uh, Kevin Owaki. I was shilling cryptogs to him, which is awesome. Uh, let me see, what's the password here? Nope, that's not it. Sound it out. <laughs> oh, there it is, so there they are. Basically, I, I minted him Gitcoin pogs and sent them to him. So if you look at our very first email, there's like, me doing this, and I made a little animated GIF and like signed the message with that to you. So I was, I was getting started early, shilling to Owaki. Uh, and another thing I learned here is once, once I had it and I had it all set up, the game mechanics were all on chain also. So you would like announce that you wanted to play a game, and that was a transaction. And someone would come along and put their stack next to yours, and that was a transaction. And then the other guy would accept that stack, and then you were finally ready to play three transactions later. And then commit and reveal is another transaction and another transaction. So I learned that like, let's just do the game mechanics. Let's do the game mechanics on chain, but let's do the coordination off chain. Let's use web 2.0 for as much as we can, kind of minimum viable decentralization. Just uh, a quick what commit reveal is. For sure, uh, for sure. Uh, actually, there's, there's like a slide on that that I did that, and I'll, I'll, I'll like dig into it there. Is that cool? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, then, um, so what I found was as I was building these games, uh, oh, and Cryptogs is live too, Cryptogs.io. You could go play it, you could play it on Trust or something, but you basically have to make a ton of transactions. What I'm learning along the way with these games is, man, this is clunky, I have to make a transaction every time. I have to have gas, the onboarding is awful. I think I talked about that. Yeah, onboarding sucks for both of those games. Okay, Dapparatus, I've built a couple things, now I'm like, well, I keep using these same, I, I keep using a MetaMask component, I keep using a gas price component, a transactions component, contra contract loader. So Dapparatus basically wraps all these things up in React, and I, and I now have Clevis to do my orchestration and Dapparatus to do my front end, and they're tightly coupled, so when I write a contract in Clevis, I just hit publish, and, that, and it drops it right into the React folder. And basically from there, I can just, from the React side, I can just say, this contract dot functcrena I wanna call go, and then the transactions handle it, and this little like transaction loader comes in. So at this point, I have like this nice little framework for rapid application development, and that really started like helping me spin up and build stuff. So just for fun, there was a nifty remote hack in Hong Kong, and I was like, I'm gonna make nifties versus nifties, because there was this tweet from uh, my buddy Matt Condon about whether we have eyes or not in the word nifty. So I made these like, uh, they're generated based on the hash of the, so basically you get in and you vote by spending a little bit of gas. And it randomly generates you an ERC721 and it goes into your inventory that you see here. And so you vote, it's like another poke at on-chain governance. It's like kind of me playing around with on-chain governance and understanding like where it falls apart. And obviously there's a lot of ways to attack this, especially if you're a whale, you can just get in. Like there's no quadratic voting or anything here, right? You're just basically, voting with your money, and that's not always the best. Uh, you can go play Nifties versus Nifties, it's still online, but guess what? You have to have Ethereum. You have to have MetaMask downloaded. Uh, one thing I learned here is like, well, so let's decouple MetaMask at least, and if they come in and they don't have MetaMask, let's at least attach them to Infura and at least read data from the blockchain, right? So, so if you don't have MetaMask, I'm still gonna show you everything and show you everyone's vote, even if you don't have, like, like you can come in on Safari. So this is where I started like realizing that we needed to have some more of that. Okay, so another thing that was kind of clicking in my mind was, I'm not just gonna post something on ETH dev and ICO to the moon. Like, it was, it's gonna take a lot more work and it's gonna take like actually contributing something meaningful to the ecosystem. And that's where the blocky miner came in. So the blocky is like your identicon. It's deterministically painted based on your address. And uh, Alex Van de Zandt uh, came up with a library and he gave me this one. I asked him for one of his blockies. And then an hour later or so, I sent him back that one and he tweeted about it. And that was like the first time that I got like attention in the space. And at the same time, uh, some of my heroes over here were working on something called ETH Avatar where I took this avatar and kind of like stretched it around your photo, but uh, eventually it didn't really work the way I wanted to. 
But uh, you can see this thing is basically mining for uh, the avatars. It's trying to figure out, it's basically generating an Ethereum account and then comparing pixel for pixel, trying to match some kind of image. So that's where I came up with like Boba Fett and I think we're gonna do like an Easter egg hunt this spring using similar technologies, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, Oh yeah, and I contributed kind of silently. If you guys participated in the Solidity Golf Contest, I was the one that was running all the back-end servers, but it was like, I'll, I'll do anything I can to help in the space, and I'll pay for all the servers, whatever. Like, I just want like to help, right? And that led to meeting some of my heroes. One of them is in this room. All right, this, this is when it got loose. So the bouncer proxy was, I was basically following a lot of people on crypto Twitter, and I would suggest it if you're interested in the space. Basically, people led me to this idea of you can take signed transactions and you can recover them on chain with EC Recover, and there's something very powerful about having that cryptographic backing. So, and, and what that is, is kind of like making it better for the UX, right? So basically, since going back to the ETH uh, avatar, the blocky miner, you could basically generate uh, thousands of Ethereum accounts per second. Like, it's really easy to generate an Ethereum account. So if I can just generate an account, I need, don't need to go to a bank, I don't need to do anything else. So I can just generate an account, and that account is basically backed by, well, cryptography from like the early 80s, but cryptography that still stands, stands the test of time, I guess. I can, I can use that key pair that we talked about earlier to sign things. Basically, I can use my private key to sign a message. And then I can send along that message and my public key and anyone using math can prove that it was me that signed that, that message. And that's very powerful. So what I can do is I can do that same, that, that little song and dance where I recovered that on chain. And if you can do that in a smart contract, all of a sudden it like opens up this possibility of like, whoa, so the person doesn't even need to make the transaction. So, so if you've written smart contracts, you know that you do a lot of like checking message.sender. It's sort of like baked into the ideals of the contract. You're making sure that like that was the person that submitted the thing. So this was a new way to kind of like, instead of using message.sender, we could use like the signer of this message. So, so Kevin could sign a message and he can send it to me. And I could put it on chain on behalf of him if he doesn't have any gas. And it could recover the fact using cryptography that he signed it. So all of a sudden, now we're using these accounts in kind of an abstracted way where he doesn't have to even interact with the blockchain anymore. He can do everything off chain and send me his signed stuff. I can't tamper with it because it's signed with those key pairs. I can pay the gas for him somehow if I'm uh, you know, incentivized to do so, and he can interact with an app. So all of a sudden, now you can have like these gasless apps. Well, gasless, like someone's paying the gas, right? But that's where kind of the bouncer proxy came through. Um, it also opened up this idea of these desktop miners where if I, so I don't have to like mine Ethereum with my computer, that's that, like I need like some beefy GPUs or whatever, but if he doesn't have any gas and he wants to interact with the blockchain and he has maybe some tokens, he can say, hey Austin, put this on chain and we can wrap up inside that meta transaction that he's going to pay me a little bit of those tokens. So he can start paying his gas in tokens, I can interact for him, pay his gas, and uh, we're all interacting with the blockchain and everybody's happy and it's still cryptographically backed. Uh, and I also started screencasting. This is when I was like, okay, this is really cool. I wanna like start talking about this and start like seeing if I can get a little momentum behind that. And then kind of things like kicked loose and we did uh, token subscriptions next. So I had a call with Kevin Seagraves and he's like, okay, these meta transactions are great, but wouldn't it be cool if you could play them over and over again. Like if you could have a subscription system, and I think that Kevin Owaki had come up with, let's, like subscriptions are important. I think this was back in March probably, and we were probably more like in June when we were thinking of this stuff, right? So, so Owaki had kind of like laid the groundwork that we need to figure out subscriptions, and uh, Seagraves was like, how do we basically replay these meta transactions over and over again without having to have someone, so, so say you have a subscription coming in, and you have to collect it every month. Basically, you've got to get onto MetaMask and say collect. Well, what if it's every day? You've got to get into a MetaMask and say collect. But like, what if we could use this message signing technique where basically Kevin Seagrave signs a message that says, once a month, I would like you to perform this task and I'll give you that message and you can hold on to it. And we needed a way in the contract to have that play over and over again. And what we did was, if, if you know about a transaction that has a nonce in it, basically has a little thing that says, 
this thing is number 21, and number 21 can only go on chain after number 20 and before number 22, and it can only go once, and if someone takes that and tries to submit it again, it won't work. That's replay protection. Well, what we wanted was to loosen that up a little bit. We wanted to actually like control the replay. So what we did is we had that nonce, but we also had a timestamp. And the first time someone makes a transaction, we write the timestamp in, and then some period that they wanted to add to it. So say once a month. So you would make a transaction, and we would take not only your nonce, but we'd create this new timestamp nonce that would say, it, it is currently this time, add an entire month worth of time, and this transaction will be valid again then. So then basically it, comes, it becomes valid again once a month, each month, and that's kind of where Gitcoin grants came from, that's where a token subscription, so we, we won the Wyoming Hackathon with this idea, and uh, the 1337 standard was sort of a, it's, it's, a, it's a headier impl implementation of this, this is kind of like a clean down version of that, but 1337 is, much more powerful. It's got like delegated execution and stuff like that. Where, where with this, we're just saying, once a month, I want you to send me X amount of tokens. The 133 standard kind of opens that up to say, once a month, I want you to execute this call data, which is much more like a, a recurring meta transaction. All right. Uh, any questions? Bang through a bunch of stuff. Anywhere? Anybody? anybody? All right. Uh, so then, uh, after kind of clunking around with my games and seeing that we can use signed transactions, it, it became clear that like mainstream adoption was, was like my calling. I wanted to figure out how we can get a ton of people in and I wanted to make the UX like super approachable. So it, there were a lot of like discussions and a lot of just kind of like nights laying awake that it's like, how do we do it, right? Well, ephemeral accounts is probably number one. So you don't have to download MetaMask. Basically, we know that we can just generate you an account in the browser and we can keep it there. Obviously, it's not super secure. It's living in local storage, right? There's, there's trade-offs for having ephemeral accounts, but they are just like session accounts or at least you know, local storage accounts. Then there's meta transactions, right? There's these signed transactions that can include call data that you can basically have someone sign and you can pay the gas for them. So we've abstracted away MetaMask, we've abstracted away gas, now there's some extra things that we can add into this, and I think that after a couple of beers we can add more things to this list, and I would love to, like hit me up and let's talk more about it, but ENS is a good way to abstract away so they don't have to see a big hash. Uh, using optimistic UI so we can abstract away block times. Uh, what else? Is there other good uh, UI stuff? I should probably add to this list, but. So I, I came up with demo, I'm gonna do a live demo and see if it works. So this is nonce upon a time. This is my, uh, I did a workshop at DevCon 4 where uh, I basically wrote this from scratch in front of the room and the room kind of joined in and also coded along with me. But we basically built this thing from scratch using Clevis and Dapparatus. And uh, the premise is basically we're gonna have this message um, and you could probably Google nonce upon a time, Austin Griffith, or something like that. There's the repo, and there's probably like a write-up about it. Word, yeah, okay, so it's all there. But the, the premise is we're gonna write a story. It's just gonna be a collaborative storytelling app. And we're going to assume that at this point, I've taken care of my civil resistance, which is kind of like one of the things you have to do way up front, and I think that every DAP developer kind of has to handle that themselves. Uh, at Gitcoin, a GitHub token is probably a really good form of civil resistance, right? Like if you've logged into GitHub and you have a valid token and we can take that token and compare it to the chain, probably gonna pay your gas, right? Like if you're, if you're submitting a, a task and it looks all good and you have a valid token, like that's worth the nickel to us to have you participate in our, without having to have ETH, right? So it, that brings me back to another tweet from Milwaukee where he said the difference between 0 .000 ETH in a, in a transaction and having to pay 0.0001 ETH or something like that. Basically, if you have to pay any ETH in a transaction, it's like astronomically harder because you have to go download, uh, you have to not just have MetaMask, but you also have to go get ETH. And getting ETH is not very easy still. It takes KYC and a bunch of other things. So what we want to do is be able to have someone like this guy over here who has a key pair who's generated on the fly. If you'll notice, this is Safari. So I do not have MetaMask here. I have a Safari account, and then I've got my normal MetaMask account over here. And what I'm also running is a relayer. So this relayer is similar to the one we're running for Gitcoin grants and a lot of other things. It's basically just listening for web requests. And if you come in with a valid transaction, we're gonna pay your gas blindly, given some kind of civil resistance. So uh, once upon a time, 
There was a frog named Jimmy. All right, right. Please work live demo gods. Yes, okay, so you can see that my Identicon has posted this message, and basically all we're doing is talking to the smart contract that fires events. It's super, super simple. So then, uh, let's go over here to this guy's account. Now this guy doesn't have any ETH. He's not able to submit it straight to the blockchain, but what he can do, uh, let's see, he had a special, oh, you don't wanna do that, uh, friend. Whew. Okay, I didn't even spell Jimmy right, Jim, Jimmy. Okay, so here we go. This is the magic moment. I don't know if this is gonna work, but basically this guy is going to wrap up a meta transaction. He's not going to submit a normal transaction. He's going to basically wrap up what the transaction would look like if it were to go on to the chain, but instead he's gonna wrap that up and sign it, and he's gonna ship it off to the relayer. The relayer is gonna take that call data, and he's gonna turn it into a real transaction, and he's gonna put it on chain and pay the gas, and hopefully, there we go. Okay, so this guy just posted on chain. It looked just like a normal transaction, but what we can see, if I zoom in here, is there are two blockies. So this little brown blocky matches this guy over here. But what's this right here, this little green one? Well, that green one is actually the relayer. And this is where it gets tricky. Basically, since you're sending it to the relayer and the relayer is submitting it on chain, if you were to look at the message dot sender, it would say the relayer was the one that submitted this transaction. So in this form of meta transactions where you're using a bouncer proxy or some kind of a, a relay system, you've got to little, do a little bit more work on your front end. So basically my front end has to go talk to not only the contract where nonce upon a time is, but it has to go talk to the proxy contract. And it has to say, hey, who just fired that transaction that I traced back, right? So you have to do one more step in, into a, a proxy contract. So it's less than ideal, but what it gets you is the ability to interact with a contract that already exists on chain, and you can do it by paying, you can pay for someone else's gas without having to redeploy anything, right? Which is, which is pretty cool. You just have to build a little bit more into your front end. Okay, so demo over, thank goodness. Okay, so mainstream adoption. Basically someone with Safari can just drop in and start participating in an app. Like, I think that's pretty powerful, and hopefully that's what's going to drive things. Uh, that moves me to, now that we've got these ephemeral keys, and we've got this stuff happening in the browser, why don't we make a wallet? So, so I had this talk with Alejandro out in San Francisco around ETH SF, and he said, we want to make this wallet for Venezuela, where uh, hyperinflation is happening. There, there's all these reasons why, basically, so, so a side thesis, a tangent thesis I have is that like we don't need blockchain in the perfect world, and I think I've talked about this, this with this group before, right? You only need blockchain when you need it, like when someone's trying to censor you, or there's hyperinflation, or uh, you know, other reasons you need decentralization. You don't really need that in a good world, and I think that in a lot of ways we kind of live in a pretty good world. There's no better time to be alive than now. So it's kind of like well, maybe we don't need all this decentralization in some places, but in some places we do, and so let's take this technology to those places where they could actually use it, right? So what if we built a wallet in a browser? Basically the keys are there, the thing can sign it, and then we're gonna make it super easy by just using QR codes. So one phone can basically visit a website, now he's got a wallet. Another phone can basically just visit a wallet, uh, website, he's got a wallet. Then we're gonna put that thing on the XDAI network. So you've got five second block times and you're paying for your gas in DAI. Two like very key components there. So now you don't have to worry about ETH, it's all in DAI, and it's super, super cheap. Like, to deploy a contract on XDAI is like 0. 0.00004 cents or something like that, it's it, $4. So you can deploy like 200 contracts for a penny. It's, it's that cheap. So uh, then, then kind of like we branched out with Gitcoin's labs for a little bit and just kind of learned new things and tried to provide value around the ecosystem as kind of other things were, were brewing. Uh, one of those was counterfactual loan payment. So you could use this, this kind of tricky method, and there's a link in here where you can use a keyless system and some trips, tricks with cryptography to basically deploy a contract eventually, but not yet. And you know what the address is going to be, and you don't control the keys for it. You basically like tweak the signature so no one basically signs it, or you sign it with just like a random signature. Then you figure out where the public address would be, and then you fund that, and then you're gonna basically eventually deploy the contract and know where it's gonna land. So we use that for at um, Dharma. At Dharma, they, uh, they give out loans, right? And then someone wants to pay back a loan. It's like this huge 
problem. They have to like send, they have to approve the tokens and then call a specific contract function and that's kind of clunky for UX. I'm always all about like, let's do 90% of the work to make it 10% smoother on the end point, on the end user. And so what if we basically built a sweeper contract that would get out there and grab the funds eventually? We could just give someone an, an address that they could send their tokens to. And then once those tokens were there, they, we could just drop this counterfactual loan payment uh, loan repayment sweeper, and it would just go out there and sweep it all up. Uh, then the Moloch. So this is where like I'm learning more and more about governance. Uh, so the Moloch is a minimum viable DAO, and I kind of dove in and just like, basically built a sandbox around it. And I think that there's kind of movement toward this. I think we'd, we'd love to see a full-blown UI by East Denver, but we'll see how that goes. Now, this is native meta transactions. So this is where, when we, when we keep thinking about this proxy sending these meta transactions, there's that issue where if you have a contract that's pre-deployed, he's gonna see that the message.sender is actually the relayer. And so there's a lot of extra work that has to go mm -hmm. in there. And so what if we're redeploying our contracts, right? What if we don't have to interface with a pre-deployed contract? We can redeploy everything. So if we're just now making our token or we're making a new ERC721, what we can do is build this into it. This, like these simple lines right here is all that it is. But basically like, so here's like a normal transfer. There's like a, a two, there's, usually when I say I'm gonna transfer a token, there's like a two and a how much and then the from is basically the message.sender. Well, in this case, what we're gonna do is have a signed message that comes in, and the from will actually be the signer. So Kevin can sign a thing that says, I wanna send five of my tokens to uh, Jimmy, Jimmy. And so then he gives me that message, and I can put it on chain, and he could even wrap a reward in that too. There's that reward there too. So he's like, I'm gonna send five tokens to Jimmy and one token to whoever puts this on chain. Here it is to anybody who wants to take it over, right? Then a relayer says, oh, I'm incentivized to do that. He doesn't have any gas, but he has tokens. I can take that and I can put it on chain and I can move all those coins around using cryptographically backed techniques and everything actually just comes from him. So when I do this transfer, just like you would in an ERC-20, instead of doing message.sender, then I do uh, the signer. And we can see there's even a reward that goes to message.sender. So I would suggest if you're deploying new contracts to think critically about using signed messages because it's gonna be a huge UX improvement if your users can just sign messages and kick them off somewhere. Okay, minimum viable payment channels. We were talking about, wouldn't it be cool at Gitcoin if we had like this mentorship program where a student could basically deposit some funds into a contract, the teacher could accept it, and then they basically start streaming back and forth. They kind of fix their problem, but as they're, as they're on that um, call, the student is silently with one of those ephemeral key pairs signing a little bit more and a little bit more of that uh, banked money. So, so say I put in a, a total of $10 deposit, I'm sending just like 25 cents every you know, 15 seconds to Seagraves where, where he's teaching me how to write Python and then I get my problem solved. I can just shut off and be done what he has to do is take that last message with the most in it and submit it on chain before the timeout and then he pulls his funds back. This is basically the spank chain model also. So the student and the teacher have new meanings there and spanking, but you, you, you can leave that up to your imagination. Okay, now we can get to commit reveal, finally. Sorry, sorry for the, uh, the delay. So commit reveal is a way to sort of hide actions or even generate random numbers on chain. So the way you do it is you come up with a secret. Um, let's just say it's a random number. And then you hash that secret, and that's called your commit. And you put your commit on chain. Then you wait for a block to be mined, and then you, you reveal your hidden number. So the, the miner who came up with that block hash doesn't know your secret. And you don't know what he's gonna come up with for that block hash. So then after that block hash is generated and you reveal your number, you can hash those two things. And of course, the player and the miner could be colluding, but it gives you some other guarantees. Basically, if the player knows that he's not colluding with the miner, it gives him a guarantee that the miner's not gonna screw him over. And the miner doesn't know about the player's stuff, so he doesn't even care about uh, what he's doing. So like, if you wanted to have a quiz where a bunch of people submit things, obviously the blockchain is public, right? So if you're submitting a bunch of uh, just plain text, people are gonna be able to see your answers. 
So what you can do is basically submit the hash of that, then later on submit the reveal, and everyone can prove that your reveal hashes to the hash that you had, right? Like it's still cryptographically backed, or at least hash backed. That's, crypt that's cryptography. Hashes are cryptography, right? Yeah, I think so. It's still backed by math on chain, and you can prove it deterministically. Did I answer that well enough, or is there more there? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. So it's like secret, and then so you got your reveal, you got your commit, you put your commit in, you put your reveal in later, and it's mixed with the previous block hash, so neither side could have known unless they're colluding. And in, in this case, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ever have like a lottery where you were grabbing a random number worth more than the block reward anyway, because then someone could collude on that. But the block reward is like two ETH. So if you're going to have like a lottery, make sure it's less than two ETH if you're using commit reveal. But if you're just catching a stupid fish in a game, it's perfect for that. It's actually totally overkill for that. Yeah. Is there any downsides to like using a signed message for the, um, the random number? So these, these aren't actually signed messages. These are like two hard transactions. The, the downside of commit reveal is the UX sucks. You basically have to hit like, yes, I would like to do a transaction. Okay, now I wait for the block to mine. Yeah, yes, like, I would like to do another one. Remembering the, the secret, like you could just like sign a message and then use that as a secret, and you just have to keep pressing buttons. So you don't have to remember. For sure, and and like an ephemeral key pair too, right? right? You could set up a session key pair, and he could do that second thing for you, right? So like there's, and that's how the like the payment channels and stuff work too. It's basically you you make one transaction with MetaMask that says this dude is my signer and I trust him up to this amount, let him go. And he'll just sign things as he goes along. Yeah. Okay. Whoop, whoop, whoop. All right. We're getting toward the end here. So uh, this is the burner wallet 2.0. So we took the wallet and we basically cleaned it up a bunch. We made it a lot more usable. And the, the key was like, okay, so if we're going to have this thing in you know uh, a third world country or somewhere where it's going to be used, it's going to need to be like better than the current system, right? So if if cash, basically the the premise of our first cypherpunk speakeasy was that cash was hyperinflated. You could buy a beer with U.S. dollars if you so chose, but it was going to cost you 6.5 million dollars, mm -hmm. and none of us had that there. There are no crypto millionaires, as far as I know. So. And the credit card systems were long past gone, right? So basically you had to use crypto. And we gave everybody the option. Like if you would like to use Bitcoin, you can use Bitcoin. If you would like to use uh, Litecoin, Litecoin was a good one. But we have this thing called the burner wallet. And you don't have to download any wallets. You don't have to worry about any seed phrases. You basically just go to this website and you have a wallet. And then we actually did like we set up an ATM. I think that Brian's in the back there, but he was sitting here basically just like taking wads of cash and shooting people's phones. Probably not like the best way to do that. And I think we have a better solution tonight that we'd like to demo for you guys. Uh, and then the burner wallet 2.2 came along. So uh, there were certain things like if you had XDAI, it was really hard to get it anywhere else. So I built a native exchange in. So basically now you can just, on your burner wallet, you can hit the exchange button and you can say, I want my XDAI to go to DAI. I want my DAI to go to ETH. I want my ETH to go to my wire account, pending, pending some integrations. <laughs> January, January 22nd, <laughs> like I'm on the phone with uh, the CEO of wire like every other day. I, I rolled over, seriously, I rolled over, rolled over and like, hey. <laughs> like he, I'm staying tight with that dude because we got to get the wire integration working. Uh, oh, and we built in better QR code scanning. so. Uh, if, if you were at the event, you may have remembered that half the devices would go to scan, and instead of being the scanner, they would see like the, the weird, like, you know, the seal crap chin, it would, it would do the, like, the rear camera. So, so then, then, then you would be like trying to do one of these where you were trying to shoot someone else's phone with your rear facing camera. So there was, that's why we're doing these events. This, this wallet is eventually gonna be used by a bunch of people. So we want to have small rooms of people use it. And it's worth a beer to me for you guys to test it out to tell me what's wrong with it. Uh, there's also like some private key management tools. Uh, burner to burner encrypted messaging. How did, how did I miss that? Okay, so Ethereum keys are public private key pairs. And you can use those public private key pairs to sign things. 
but it's asymmetric cryptography. It may not be the best asymmetric cryptography. It may not be meant for this, but again, private keys were not meant to live in local storage, but it works really well in this situation. So if you want to send an encrypted message to your buddy, you can actually use their Ethereum address. Uh, star, you can't actually use their Ethereum address. So if you, <laughs> if you want to actually encrypt a message for someone using their Ethereum address, what, what actually you need is the public key. And an Ethereum address is actually a hash of a public key. So going back to hashes, giving someone, given someone's public, given someone's public address, you can not know their public key because it's a one directional thing. But you can do this really cool trick. Uh, Taylor from my crypto talked about it, I think, and it was like it's so awesome. I'm going back to see like Stack Overflow posts from like 2016 that are answering the questions that I need that are like still like relevant, so awesome. But basically what happens is you can, you, you can look at someone's transaction on chain. So a, a resulted transaction has the to, the from, the data, the amount, but it also has an RS and V, and that's the pieces of the signature. So given the pieces of the signature and the entire transaction itself, you pack it all back up again and then recover it, you get the public key. So what has to happen is there's this little ceremony that happens. So basically I, I shoot Seagrave's uh, QR code and I send him $3 and now he's got my address and he sends me a message back like, hey, thanks, right? That message is public, it's written into the data on the blockchain. What if we wanted to be a little bit more private about that? What he does is he hits this wave button right here and it starts the ceremony. Basically he's saying, hey, let's, let's go to channel submarine maneuver, right? Try to be a little bit more private, right? And so what he's doing is he's signifying that he wants me to unroll that signature, get his public key, and start sending him messages encrypted now. So I wave at him, he waves at me, and now this encrypted channel exists. We're still writing these messages right on chain, right into the data field of a transaction. But it's super cheap, and it's five-second blocks, so basically we're chatting burner to burner, fully encrypted, and it all exists on the blockchain, and there's no infrastructure there. This is all just the blockchain. So the signed message is basically just a hash that like, you, can, you can reveal, but you, you need to prove that someone has signed something, you need the message and the signature. So you still have to get that message out there somewhere. So you could maybe like send it through some other channel, but yeah, still yeah. it's like not, like you want end-to-end -end encrypted, no one can touch this no matter where it goes. So, so um, is, is the public one free, but the private one like you have to pay for the private chat or? Pay for it. No, no, no. This is all, this is all free and open all source. Free. Please take it. Yeah. No, Not just that. Do, like, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. You pay. Yes. Every single transaction you pay. But it's like I said, it's like you can send 200 messages and it costs a penny. Okay. So it's, to me, virtually free. But maybe that stacks up when you, you have, have like, millions. The right way to send someone, like, a private message. Then you don't even need this. No, no, but I mean just to get that initial secret. Okay, sure, yeah, and that's how, so usually when you set up a cryptographic channel, you only use asynchronous, asymmetric cryptography once, and it's just to exchange those keys. Because asymmetric cryptography doesn't allow you to send a whole lot, so what you do is you say, I'm, I'm gonna sign this with your public key, and I'm gonna send you a new key that's like a symmetric key, and once you have that new key, then we can communicate. That's how like SSL works and, and SSH, like. Basically, we, with, with, our, with our asymmetrics, we just give a key back and forth, and then we use that key to go symmetric, and then we can like, encrypt large junk, junk and do it quicker. So you could, yes, you could basically just, like this ceremony is happening, it could be like wave, wave, here's a symmetric key, now let's go to a whole other channel and just communicate from here. But the point of having this on-chain is, there's these reasons why you wanna go talk to an account. The, the Billy story is really good. So, uh, Am I allowed to tell the Billy story? Like he accidentally, he, he submitted, so he was getting paid for ETH Berlin. He was getting a reward for ETH Berlin. And I'm, I'm sure I'm allowed to tell the story, I don't know if that is. Anyways, he's getting rewarded for something he did at ETH Berlin, and he gives a, a test account to Gitcoin. So Gitcoin sends the money to his account, but he didn't, he didn't realize he was sending a, a, like a, basically it was an exposed account. And it was like immediately. As soon as the money landed in that account, it was gone. 
And he was just like, what, what, what? Like he was waiting for it too, because he knew it was like, oh, maybe this, maybe like, this is probably, because I, I definitely have like, this is my browser where it's like, these are my loosey gooseys and these are, you know, my tidy whities No. <laughs> <laughs> my security, whatever. Anyways, he would use the loosey goosey to receive this money and sure enough, it was gone. Well, what he did was he got on Etherscan, right? So if you have, if someone takes your money, what's your way of talking to them, right? Well, you can get on Etherscan and you can throw something in the comments. Like basically like he went over the fence, but it's public and everybody could see it, right? What if someone steals your money and you send them some more money and a message that looks all jarbled, but the person is smart enough to say, Let's try, let's try decrypting that with my private key and see if there's a message there, right? You get their attention with the value send, but then you also encrypt a message along with it. So this is a way to send directly to Ethereum accounts and use Ethereum natively to do your encryption. So final slide. Uh, kind of my uh, underlying wants for tonight is I will buy a beer for anyone who wants to participate in this. If you don't want to participate in this, you should shoot that QR code now so I can see if it works on your phone or not. Because the whole point of this is just to make sure that this works on everybody's phone. And if it doesn't work, I need to figure out why, right? So basically, if you, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to give any more information away. How would you scan this QR code? Go. Does it, does it take you to burnerwallet.io? Like basically what should happen is you should land, Dave's got it, Dave's got an account, he's up. You should land at burnerwallet.io and you should have an account. Okay, who's, who's got an account? We're gonna do a little live demo here. All right, here's Dave. I'm gonna shoot, so I'm gonna hit scan with mine and I'm gonna scan Dave's. All right, hold that up. My beautiful assistant Dave is going to watch his account go uh, up five cents. I'm sending him five cents. Should take about five seconds and he will have five cents. So that isn't even five cents. That's actually 0 0.05 of a uh, ERC20 token I have. So now Dave could go to the exchange and basically that's like wrapped ether but it's living on XDAI. So he's got an ERC20 token that he can exchange back for XDAI. Then he can bridge that XDAI to DAI and then he can move that DAI back to his bank account. But there's one more catch. The cool thing about using ERC20s is we can build custom logic in. For instance, say your event wanted only vendors to be able to off-ramp. So you can't actually do anything with that money, but you can spend it. And it's going, to, it's going to basically persuade you to spend all your money at this event. So the way I get the money out is with paper wallets. So last time when we had bags of money in our pockets and we were basically a crypto ATM, uh, it was cheaper for us, but it was a little messier. So I'm willing to buy you guys a beer. There's basically $10 on each one of these. And you can, there's a private key on the inside. And if you scan that private key, you will have $10 that is only good at the attic over there. <laughs> so if you want one, raise your hand and I will give you a paper wallet. And also, if you don't want one, you can have one anyways because... It's just an ERC-20, you already got one. It's just an ERC-20 token. So, you, I actually yeah. said this. What'd you do? I sent it to my XDAI wallet, not realizing they were different things. Okay, so they are, they are slightly different, but that should that, work. That was my question. What's the difference between my XDAI.io versus my burner? Well, this is an ERC-20, and XDAI right. works on it, exactly. not That's ERC-20. Right? Keep it secret, yeah. keep it safe. Keep it secret. Keep so it I could probably transport my private key from my XDAI wallet back into my burner That's exactly wallet, what you would do. That's exactly what you would do. Anybody else? Here, we'll did you get one? Go on. Eventually, <laughs> that's how bankers will work. They won't like you. They're not going to like, take your money there. They're like, I'll bring your private keys for you. So these ERC, these ERC20 tokens are only good over at the attic, and we're going to uh, basically test so, out our wallets and our POS system. So there's going to be an iPad over there that's going to have stickers, and you can just shoot their sticker, and you can send funds to them, and it'll have it pre-populated. So you shoot a sticker, it's going to say, you're going to spit send 650 to, you got money? You got 10 bucks? All right, all right. So you basically scan something, and you'll send 650, and he'll see on chain, remember that little message? It'll say, like, I want a draft beer. He'll see it on his screen, you show it on your screen, he's going to hand you a beer. That's 
that's the POS system. What do you think? So, so I guess my question is, like, when, say I sent, I sent my $10 to my XI wallet, which is recoverable, but mm -hmm. say that I was oh, here. But I'll just give you that. And, and I sent it to 0x0. Zero zero. Because this is an ERC-20 and not actually XDI on burnerwallet.io, I didn't actually cost you anything by burning that 10, 10 ETH, because you're only really paying when, I when offer you cash exactly. out. Exactly. Okay. So, so there is basically those dollars are pinned to fiat in my pocket, and once, okay. and and if people don't spend it, it doesn't cost me anything, right? So there's you have this extra logic. It like works perfect for an event. You have this extra right. logic built into it. You have uh, the ability to give people like kind of more than you have, which is us <laughs> heavy crypto guys aren't totally like every single dollar that went out there. I have cash in my pocket to back. So. To be clear about that, like I'm not uh, like I'm not doing the airline thing where they overbook the flights, right? Quick question: So if I close out of this, turn off my phone. Great question. Uh, how do I get? Uh, let's, let's do it. See what happens. So, what basically what browser are you in right now? Uh, Apple Safari. Safari. Okay. So basically, that local storage is going to live on your phone and tell you clear local storage, but it's a burner wallet, right? So what you should do is you should go home. You should pull up burnerwallet.io on a machine with MetaMask or some other injected Web3 that does a better job of holding those keys, and you should scan that one, and you should send the funds there. And then you should just burn your wallet, right? Burner wallet. So you can generate a new wallet. What's cool is there's like a key, there's like a private key section. If you go down to advanced, you can find some really cool little Easter eggs I've added in there. But basically, you can paste in a private key, or you can type in your own mnemonic. And there's no rules to these mnemonics. This is another thing that like, I catch a lot of shade on the internet about. Basically, you can type in any phrase you want, and it's going to generate you a seed phrase, or generate you a private key from that seed phrase, and you can spend money on it. But if I type in something that no one's going to think of, even if it's only 12 characters long, you're only storing $20, it's not a big deal, I can like, kind of trash all that stuff, come back with another phone or another device, type in that same little password, and there's all the money again. right? So there's, there's a lot of power to that. So what you should do usually is sweep this. This is super hot funds, right? But you've got your paper wallet, right? Worst case scenario, you've got your seed phrase in your pocket and you can scan it up if you need to again. Cool, but did you try it? Did you turn it all the way off and bring it all the way back? Yeah. You should kill that sucker. It'll come back. It usually, I mean, I've had, so after that night, I had like $130 in a local storage key pair and I took it home and like went to sleep. I, I was not worried about it. I should have been probably a little bit more worried about it, right? So there's a lot of attack surfaces here, right? A lot of web 2.0 attack surfaces because this is just a website. The, the private key's not going out to the website, but you could spoof the website and start sending them stuff and get them to send you back. So there's like DNS attacks. I think my crypto experienced DNS attacks, right? Like a lot of those ICO places experience uh, those DNS attacks. So this, there's still like some some Web 2.0 surface here. And it's the uh, IP best hash like you can get. Oh, like hell yeah. Yep. That that's better, but you lose UX there, right? If you have to, if I have to give you an address that's like IPFS giant ass hash, or you can see like xdi.io, it's just a little bit nicer. But not 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 that much big of a, It's not that big of a difference, right? So you could actually run this wallet again. You can run this from just checking out a GitHub repo and working on it. Like there's no, like this is all free, it's all open. There's no revenue yet. But boy, so if you look at the exchange, it is complicated. If you wanna go, if, if I send Michael 10 bucks for letting me crash on his couch, and I'm not, right? You got an Airbnb guy? Okay, if, <laughs> if you have an open couch, I will send you $10, so let me sleep on it. But if so, uh, I stay at Seagrave's house, and I send him 10 bucks as a thank you for letting me crash out on his couch. What he has to do is kind of a lot. Let's say, let's say it's even the speakeasy coin and you're allowed to, let's say the vendor tonight was actually going to do the full off ramp. He would take that coin and he would unwrap it. That's one transaction, five seconds, not that bad. Now he's got X die. Now he's got to unbridge it. So for every X die, there is die locked up protecting it. So he's got to basically burn that X die and release the die. And that takes probably like a few minutes, maybe a couple minutes. Brian, you think? Yeah, a couple minutes. Now he's got die. Now, if you have an account with just die in it, you're hosed because you can't do anything with just die. You've got to have gas to move that die around. 
So now you've got to send yourself some ETH after all of this. So then now you can send, now you can have enough gas to move that die to either back to ETH and, and then off ramp it to uh, Coinbase or Wire or local Ethereum. But that's too much work, right? That's hard mode. And I want hard mode to be available and I need it to all work for, for the cypherpunks. But wouldn't it be cool if you could type in, I have $15 in X die, shoot that stuff to my, my wire account, right? Just like my wire account's automatically attached. I don't have to put any accounts in. I just want $15 and I want it in my bank account now. So then I can have a system running that detects that you did that and I can go through all the song and dance for you. I'll even provide the gas and move your stuff to your account for you. But I'm probably gonna take like 10 cents or you know a percent, right? And in crypto winner, revenue is kind of important these days. So these little tweaks where we can find ways to generate revenue that it's actually worth it to the end user is pretty exciting. Schwag right here. Who wants me to go buy them a beer? Any questions? Woo! Awesome. Thank you.